the spectrum centralization decentralization i think this is probably a good time to talk about the difference between bitcoin and shitcoins because mm-hmm. well this has a lot to do with how decentralized bitcoin is relative to everything else um how do you unpack that for people that maybe aren't as familiar with decentralization what is what is the fundamental difference between bitcoin and shitcoins um in the context of of what we've talked about so far yeah so i think bitcoin is i touched on it already i think bitcoin is commonly and falsely viewed as the first and you know hence its immaculate conception and all these sort of vaguely blasphemous like <laughs> things we like to describe it with it wasn't right there was this is the big history of digital mm-hmm. currency attempts and all of them had some central point of failure. Mm -hmm. Bitcoin did too, but it was kind of, it wasn't, it was more like you'd need to perform social engineering and stuff to destroy it. Like there wasn't a bank, right? Right. At the beginning. And it trended towards decentralization and it kept its, like blockchain is the worst possible database imaginable. Mm -hmm. It's so bad, but if you can do what, if you can keep what it's being used for minimal enough, then you have a hope in hell of enough people storing a copy of it that it becomes decentralized and then it becomes useful for something. Yeah. But so everyone else trying to do features on top of blockchains was like the lo- most bad way you could possibly approach anything. It's mm-hmm. like, let's do Uber on the blockchain. Mm-hmm. It's like, all that's going to do is make everything a million times less efficient and mm-hmm. no one's incentivized to keep copies of it lying around. So yeah. all you just have is the world's worst database. Right? It really only works for money, right? Yeah. Because it yeah. only works for one money as well. Yes. If it doesn't work with Bitcoin, it's yeah. not coming back. That's it's right. over. Yeah. So, um, d- so I think yeah, those it, it's about the trend, right? So if you if you're like, we can bring out more and more features, we can have the world's fastest blockchain, like, and it will cost you a half a million dollars in equipment to be able to verify it. So no one does, which makes it not even worth your time because you're playing a game that isn't, you know, if you run a Solana node and you actually <laughs> buy the hardware mm-hmm. to do it, like the they will just change the rules on you anyway, mm-hmm. and then you'll go along with it, or you'll run. I mean, you saw it with Ethereum Classic, right? That was like trying to have a Bitcoin mentality in, mm-hmm. in shitcoin mm-hmm. land, mm-hmm. and you just get brushed to the side. Mm-hmm. No one cares about Ethereum Classic, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Because it, that's not what their culture is about. Right. Bitcoin culture is about decentralization of rule enforcement, and it actually lives up to that. Mm-hmm. So that's why we get to be maxis. Yeah. That's why we get to have it. It's not, it, everything is downstream from that prioritization and the block size wars was that which or the fork wars was that it was we can't be making blocks bigger to satisfy people that want to transact because that the trade-off is that we make life more expensive for people that run nodes and they are the most important element of this thing Mm -hmm. so the fact that that won out in the conversation says we have a culture that respects decentralization of enforcement of the rules not mining which is decentralized compliance with the rules right Mm -hmm. you've got the people that comply with the rules and you've got the people that enforce the rules and again like if you're playing a game you're you're complying with a rule set to play the game properly Mm -hmm. but if that if the rules are only if it's basketball right everyone knows the rules to basketball so it's worth me getting good at basketball but if it's like some new game with one person in charge of it it's not worth becoming good at the rules and spending 10 years practicing it because it will change right right so, so yeah, that's where Bitcoin gets its superiority complex from, in my opinion. It's, mm-hmm. it's justified and vindicated, but we have to maintain that. So when, I mean, spam is a topic we have mm-hmm, coming mm-hmm. up. And if you have shitcoin culture come into Bitcoin and go, we don't care about nodes anymore. They're just mm-hmm. there if we need them mm-hmm. and they might leave. If you're going to say, all right, they're not just people storing the blockchain because they're incentivized to do it because it's financial history that's relevant to them. If there's a bunch of JPEGs and stuff stored there as well, that's you're tacking on an additional bit of work for them that they're not paid to do. They're not mm. interested in doing it. It's non-consensual, and it's and it's an, it's just fundamentally what an abuse of a protocol looks like. Mm. And the miners are the it's Bitcoin's game theory doesn't just hold together and perfectly work. With that's what the fork wars was. It was literally these guys want that but those guys want something else so we had a war over it it's not just like satoshi made a perfect system and now everyone is happy and we'll sing kumbaya Mm -hmm. and walk off into sunset there's actual times when we disagree with each other 
So this is one of those terms, right? Nodes definitely don't want people storing JPEGs on them. And they've, we've made it way more expensive um, for nodes to run. I don't, I don't want to be, I don't want to over exaggerate there, um, but it's worse. Like back in the 2022 era, Raspberry Pi 4, solid state drive, USB connected, 48 hours to sync up from scratch. Now you have the next iteration, Raspberry Pi 5 with an SSD. You want to sync up the network. 110 hours okay a lot worse and that's after one that's mm -hmm. after two years of growth mm -hmm. we've gone from 48 hours to over 100 hours if it carries on growing at that rate you basically kiss that class of hardware goodbye which is like the 200 hundred dollar node mm. and if you're that comes from a mindset of shit coinery that says nodes don't really matter miners will mine anyway they will continue complying with a a smaller and smaller group of enforcers mm. to the point where the game starts to become riggable again. Mm. That's the trend. And then are you going to have, you know, a network difficulty of 84 trillion, which is how hard it is to find a block right now on average. Are you going to meet that requirement if it's enforced by, you know, 60,000 nodes? Demonstrably, yes. 10,000, probably. 1,000, no way. Mm. That's too small because you can find those 1,000 users and you can, you can say to them, Mm, we're going to make all this arbitrary and we're going to not only will it be arbitrary but it will be changeable and once it once it becomes realistic to change it you can't have that high hash rate you know that wall the barrier of energy whatever Sa sailor mm -hmm. describes it mm -hmm. as right the encrypted wall of energy like you don't have that anymore it becomes mushy and soft yeah. and you can just go all right i'll get around that i don't need to get over it anymore right so, oh man, I'm going way off. Is this, no, no, this yeah. is really good though. So, Block Wars 2017 hopefully provides some lessons for what we're going through now, which I get. Well, all right. So, first question The block size war of 2017, where again, ostensibly there was a group of Bitcoiners that said we needed larger blocks to process, to put more transactions in each block to make mm -hmm. Bitcoin more transactable as a global medium of exchange. The contrarian view to that was hey, this is an attack on decentralization. You're basically yeah. increasing the cost and/or difficulty of running a node, which lowers the number of nodes, which compromises yeah. decentralization in the way you're describing. Is this another one of those? This is that you're saying this, yeah. And, and I don't know what what do we call this? It's gone by ordinals, you know, yeah, BRC, inscriptions, inscriptions stamps, uh, runes. There's yeah. very a lot of different flavors of arbitrary right. data storage. But a lot of so, people say that this is, and this is kind of the camp I've been in up until this point. Like it's a permissionless system. So if you find another use for it, well, then fucking you, you know, do whatever you want with it. It's like. Mm -hmm. When I give you a hammer, I don't say you can only build houses with this hammer. You know, don't build any tree houses or any of this. It's like. I kind of viewed Bitcoin that way, but you're saying this is more like a social attack on Bitcoin in the same way the block size war was in 2017? Yeah, I think it's a big topic, right? And it's one that Ocean got thrown into because mm -hmm. when we launched, we had different mempool policies to what most people have. Mm -hmm. And they are in incredibly easy to defend, but mm -hmm. it, it was due to a general poor understanding in Bitcoin of what people's own nodes do mm -hmm. it looked like an ideological faux pas so what we did was you know we we trod on the red exclamation mark tile right and it's like this is censorship right all transactions are created equal and we're like actually ideologically you're actually correct right but that is also never how bitcoin worked and this mm -hmm. just wasn't well understood so we have a long history starting with satoshi of trying to minimize the amount of arbitrary data that gets made into the Bitcoin blockchain because it's fundamentally not of interest of no, for nodes to store that stuff. So spam filtration, as it was called, was a part of Bitcoin forever. And mm -hmm. if you're running a node right now, it's the agreed upon way at the end of the op return wars uh, for us to say, all right, here's how much data you can store that's nothing to do with financial history, just you want to store data, Here's the default standard for the network. It's not enforced at the consensus level, so you can go outside this if you want to mine your own blocks or pay a miner out of band. Mm -hmm. But if you want to just use the network and have the efficiency of submitting it to everyone's mempool and having it flood the network, you need to fit within these confines, which limited it to 83 bytes of op return. Mm -hmm. So if you want 84 bytes of op return, 
You don't see any of those in the blockchain, even though they're consensus valid. Mm -hmm. Because at the end of the day, getting it in blocks is what you want, but getting it to flood the network is also pretty useful mm -hmm. as a way of getting it ultimately in the blockchain. So starting with Satoshi, yeah, we got, there was a lot of spam filtration. There's long conversations and threads on Bitcoin talk between him and Gavin and people and Jeff Garzik back mm -hmm. when he was based. It was amazing. And they did a lot of things. And you had counterparty come along and the same arguments. People saying, we want to store videos and JPEGs inside Bitcoin's blockchain. We want immutability for our data. And funnily enough, it was basically enough to say, we don't want you to do that, go away. And mm -hmm. then they went, well, screw you. We'll do it in Ethereum and we'll do it over on other networks. And that was great. It was a happy time. And uh, the actual way Bitcoin Core is designed reflects that. So Op Return came around as an olive branch saying, look, there's not all arbitrary data storage or spam is created equal. Some of it really hurts Bitcoin. Some of it doesn't really matter mm -hmm. and everything in between that. So ordinals hurt particularly bad because it was an attack on fungibility. They're literally saying one Bitcoin does not equal one Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. There's nothing worse than that, right? You can superimpose. That's what KYC is, is a superimposed interpretation of what whether a coin is good or not right mm, so people mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. like in the lexicon of bitcoin that i have my kyc stash and my non-kyc stash mm -hmm. you're literally just saying one bitcoin does not equal one bitcoin sure at the protocol level we know they're all equal which is good but you can impose uh, an interpretation on top of bitcoin that seeks to undermine that which is what ordinals fundamentally do they say there are these rare sats that mm -hmm. are more valuable than other sats so you start having people pay hundreds or thousands of dollars to get a transaction in the blockchain that only moves one sat. Now that, from, a, from Bitcoin's theory, that breaks it because mm -hmm. no one is supposed to be doing that. No one is ever supposed to say, hey, I'm going to move, I'm going to pay a thousand dollars to move a single Satoshi. If you're doing that and, a, and someone just using Bitcoin in a fungible capacity wants to compete with you in the transaction fee mm -hmm. market, they're going to get outcompeted every time because mm -hmm. I'm never going to spend a thousand sats, sorry, a thousand dollars to move, to move you know, anything yeah. less than that. It yeah. doesn't make any sense. Right. So Bitcoin has no way to counter these kinds of arbitrary interpretations put on top of it. So, but I mean, all that is to say there are different kinds of spam, right? And we settled on one that was like, if you're going to store it, please do it in a way that at least doesn't bloat the UTXO set, which is what op return is. Mm -hmm. Op return creates provably unspendable outputs. So you can just put text in there if you want. You can put data in there. You can even send sats to an op return output, mm -hmm. but then they'll never be spendable. So every time someone puts sats in there, they're dead, and you can remove them from the UTXO set, mm. which is a very expensive part of running a node is maintaining a UTXO set because mm -hmm. it's the most important part of it, really. Right. So, you know, you had these spammers, and they declared themselves attackers. They're like, hey, I want to mess up Bitcoin as much as possible. Mike in space famously said, inscriptions don't hurt Bitcoin as much as possible. So he did what was called stamps, which were intentionally bloating the UTXO set just to make life difficult, right? You're not going to have, like, you know about UTXO management, right? It makes mm -hmm. more sense to have one Bitcoin as a UTXO than a million hundred sat UTXOs. Sure. Those are unspendable. From a transaction right? fee efficiency standpoint. Exactly. Yeah. So Bitcoin sort of assumes you wouldn't create billions and billions of pointless, unspendable UTXOs. So people that want to store data and make fake transactions to, to sort of shoehorn those transactions in, they don't care about that. So they'll mm -hmm. make these dust level outputs, like thousands and thousands of, of outputs or UTXOs that are only 546 sats. That is a dead, useless UTXO. But they did it so that they could stash a bunch of arbitrary data at the same time. Mm. That was expensive to the network overall. And it's why we lost the Raspberry Pi, basically, which is... Mm. It's arguable. Some people say, oh, okay, it takes 110 hours now rather than 48. Like that, that trajectory is unsustainable, right? Mm -hmm. So when the Raspberry Pi 6 comes out, if we carry on at the rate we have been, it will take you two months or three months to be able to download the blockchain. It's just worse, right? So that was, that was the stamp spam. And then op return was like the nice way to do it. That was the olive branch we extended. Right. And most of the spam has died now apart from runes, which just uses op return which is the least harmful form of spam there is. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this episode, click here to find more just like it and here to find our most recent episode. Also, make sure to like this video to help shine light on the corruption of money. 
and be sure to subscribe to this channel to stay connected.